Jesus said, uh, if you need something, ask. If you need something, ask your Father, which is in heaven. In the name of, and he will take care of the need. Do you believe that? I do. I've seen it for years. He will take care of the need. That's personal need, that's corporate need, that's community need, that's whatever. We're going to talk about some of these things in a few minutes here. Prayer uh, can be either or. It can be, Lord, take care of my needs, our needs, or it can be, Lord, to you belongs praise and glory. And that's what we offer today in the name of Jesus. Loving Father, we honor you, we praise you, we glorify you because all these things belong to you. They belong to us because Jesus has purchased them for us. You've given us another day, another week, another opportunity to come here as a little family and community and seek blessings. That's what we seek. And blessings come from the Spirit. Blessings come from the Father. Blessings come, and all we have to do is ask in the name of Jesus. That's the instruction. That's what we do. I thank you for the strength to meet another day. Bless every person present and everyone who cannot be here but will hear on a disc or by whatever means. We thank you, we honor you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to be reminded of some things that Ellen White wrote more than a hundred years ago. She believed them to be present truth in her day. And these statements I think you've probably read or at least you've heard them in my presentations through the last 30, 40 years. One of the statements from her pen says, uh, I see the necessity, necessity, key word. I see the necessity of making haste, haste, key word, to get all things ready for the crisis. Now, those who were alive a hundred years ago and heard the, quotes, inspired person say these things or write these things, they tried everything they could to be obedient to those words. I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for the crisis. The crisis, it's right here on us. It's right here. And uh, through these years of waiting, waiting, waiting for those words to have application and meaning, through the years, we have seen people come and go. They've lived out their lives. It's been more than 100 years since Ellen White was here. It's been more than a hundred years since her words were shared. Another quotation we might be reminded of. Said the angel, she's talking about something that was shown to her in a vision. Said the angel, tell the people to, you remember that statement? Hurry, hurry, hurry. It's been more than a hundred years. All the hurrying people are dead and gone. How do we make sense? How do we get the blessing that supposedly is contained in this instruction? How do we obtain it? Well, Peter says, uh, the prophets study the signs. They observe the times. And the word signify is used, but it's really signify. This is what was made plain to Daniel when he wanted to understand why things were being shown to him in the future 
about the future. And Daniel was uh, oft complaining, I see, but I don't understand. And finally, at the close of his writing, 12 chapters, we, we've divided it into 12 chapters, the book of Daniel. At the close of his work, his writing, he said, I see, but I don't understand. And then something very interesting and troubling was spoken. It's recorded. It's not for you to know, Daniel. It's not for you to know. Shut up your visions and dreams. Shut up your writings. Shut them up for the, come on, the time of the end. Shut up your book until the time of the end. Now we know in Revelation, particularly Revelation chapters 10 and 11 and onward, that the time is future. And John is writing 600 years after Daniel. Almost 700 years. And in chapter 10, we find the little book. This is verbatim out of Daniel chapter 12. And the angel has a little book in his hand, open. And before chapter 10 finishes, the word is that, say to the people, eat it. Eat it up. It will be sweet, and then it will be, uh, we're going to see some of this, uh, hopefully, today, and put some meaning to it. Um, it's been 45 years since I started traveling at the invitation of others, not inviting myself. 45 years, that's a long time, that's half a lifetime. I had no idea when I started traveling how far, how long, how much, how many. I had, I had no understanding of those things. When God calls people to do something, no matter who it is, it may be you, it may be me, it could be someone else. When God calls someone to do something, he does not see fit to show every day, every week, every month, every year what's going to happen before it happens. Does God know what's going to happen before it happens? Yes, He does. I know the end from the beginning. Well, why doesn't He share these things? Because it's not for your good to know these things. And yet, it is clearly revealed, I believe, in the Bible, and certainly in the writings of Ellen White, that there is a time to come when you will need this information. You will need the things that are locked up in these prophetic writings. I like the way Jesus said it in the Gospel of John. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of Truth, that's the Holy Spirit, I believe that's referring to the latter rain. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into how much truth? All truth. And He will show you things to come. That's the truth that Daniel was looking for. That's the truth that Advent believers were looking for and still look for. Things to come. We'd like to know ahead of time. There's a whole body of truth, writings from the pen of Ellen White that could be labeled as these are the things that are coming. Get ready for the storm. A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for this crisis. Events cash their shadows before them. Tell the people, find a little place out in the country where the houses are not crowded closely together, where you'll be, will be free from the influence of others in so far as possible. Find a place where you can take your family, especially if you have a young family, where you can 
grow something to eat. Now wait a minute. The grocery stores are full of food. Why do you want to grow something to eat? Don't say because it's healthy food. It's better than, but it's not necessarily organic or not necessarily whatever. Why would you want to grow something to eat? What does that suggest? Exactly what Jesus said will start or begin the time of sorrows. Matthew 24. What, what will be the problem with food? And there shall be famines and pestilences, diseases. You listening? It appears to me, this is my take on many years of looking at these things, trying to dig and understand where they fit, how they fit, and what we should or should not do. She talks about a time coming when I saw that if God's people had food laid by in store, in the pantry, or in the field, violent hands would take it from them. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly to God. That's interesting to me. There's some point in time coming in the which people are starving, people are in famine, people are, they are sweeping through the land to find something to eat. And if you have food and you try to stand there and protect it and try and keep people away from it, they'll just get rid of you and steal it anyhow. Are you listening? It takes wisdom to know when to say no and when to say yes. It takes wisdom. It takes instruction from above, from someone who knows the time and who knows the need, the necessity. Where do these things fit? How do they fit? Well, I want to take you to the book of Daniel, where else? But I'm going to do it with a piece of chalk on the board. The book of Daniel, from the first word to the last word, contextually, contextually means the whole of the book of Daniel. Time of the end. That's easily demonstrated, easily shown, but not easily comprehended. Very sincere people, ministers, Bible scholars, ordinary laypersons, many, many people sincerely believe that the book of Daniel was all about Rome and Babylon and Medo-Persia and whatever. And where did they find that? Oh, Daniel chapter 2. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. The only problem is it doesn't say that. You're this head of gold. That's Babylon. And if you keep reading Daniel chapter 2, which is the first vision given to Nebuchadnezzar, and the first vision recorded by Daniel, there's a time coming at the end when the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, the iron and clay mixed will be struck by the stone coming in the heavens and turn to powder and be blown away. If they're 800 years before or 1,000 years before or 3,000 years before, they cannot all be struck at the same time. So are you trying to say that people believe the lie? No. God has demonstrated repeatedly that he has to keep his people alive and encouraged and full of hope. And when one generation passes, the message of hope has to go on to the next generation and the next generation. Well, what if we're the last generation? What if we are the end time people? What does it mean? 
Well, this is something that uh, I believe is correct. You'll have to forgive me. There was a time in my life when I could write without scribbling, but I put these on the board for a reason. I am totally, thoroughly, completely persuaded that they're all about the same issues in the same time, the time of the end. In Daniel chapter 2, it's not difficult to show this and demonstrate this. For God has shown thee, O king, what shall be or what shall occur in the latter days. When God will change the times and the seasons. The latter days. That's the first vision. You are this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. But the gold that you are and the gold that you have is going to fade to silver. So there's a diminishing I'm just going to indicate this is going to lose its value. There's a great tree that feeds the whole world, that reaches all around the world. There's a great tree. You're this great tree. Everyone, even the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, look to you for But you're going to be cut down. Here we are. Instead of four metals, we have four beasts. We have a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a terrible beast. How many? Four. A lion, a bear, a leopard, and a terrible beast. The terrible beast in Daniel says he's nondescript. You can't, you, he doesn't look like anything you've ever seen. But the lion is going to lose his strength and power. The bear is going to receive impetus, pushing. And the leopard is going to have four heads and four wings, which means he moves very quickly and over a great territory. You have to just check it out. There's a diminishing every time. There's the notable horn and the notable horn at a certain point, and when he was strong, the notable horn was, come on, what's the word? Broken, it actually says shattered. The notable horn is broken. I'm asking you to just consider the possibility that four and really more portions of the book of Daniel are talking about, you're the head of gold. You're the great tree. You're the lion. There's a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Which is the strongest? Come on. The lion. the lion is. And he doesn't just have sparrow or hummingbird wings. He has what kind of wings? Eagle wings. You, this, is a, this is a beast representing a power a civil power, an earthly power, and he's going to be humbled. So I'm back to Ellen White. I see the necessity of making haste. There's a storm coming, relentless in its fury. There's something ahead at the time of the end. There is something that is coming. And... Uh, Whatever you're going to do to get ready for the crisis, you have to do it. Now, that sounds self-serving at first. But not everyone has the ability to just make preparation for a global crisis. So Jesus said it will be as it was in the days of Noah. 
were people instructed to get ready for the flood? Was there a call to people to get ready for the flood? Of course there was. God didn't say, uh, give them 30 days and let's drown them out. How long was the preaching going on? 120 years. All right? Tell me why the people laughed, paid no attention, little or no attention. Tell me why. There were no great oceans. What are you building a ship for on dry land? And who knows what a ship is? You, know, you listening? So Peter interprets that, and you can check First and Second Peter out. He talks about Noah and the flood and all these things, and they 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 should have known, they could have known, but they they didn't. They were skeptics. All things continue as they were. I've heard that many times in my own preaching. What part do you and I have to play in what's ahead? Well, this is where I want to focus for a few minutes, please. If you represent a family, a, a father and a mother and young children, you have, a, you have a different responsibility. You have a different burden than someone who's 60 or 70 or 80 years of age. Our children are gone out there and they are old enough and capable enough to take care of themselves if they've got sense enough. But if I'm a parent with young children at home uh, and I understand that a hurricane is coming into the Gulf, what should I do? Well, I think we should gather around one another and get on the beach and stand there and watch this. Do you know how many, how many idiots in the South and along the Gulf Coast watch? They enjoy watching the storm come. If Judy and I are on vacation and down at the beach and uh, the news changes and the storm's just coming into the Gulf, I tell Judy, we got to get out of here. Oh, no, it's two weeks away. Oh, no, it's three weeks away. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's pack up and get out of here. Why should you get out ahead of time? All you have to do is look at one of those recent hurricanes in Texas. People decided at the last minute to get on the interstate system. They didn't get very far and some lady ran out of gas. <laughs> Literally, people began running out of gas on the freeways. Why? Why didn't they keep going? Because it was stopped up, jammed up with people waiting to the last minute. Well, maybe it won't hit here. Maybe it'll go over there. Maybe, maybe, maybe. No, let's go home. That's what Ellen White is talking about. That's what I'm talking about. It's foolish to play guesswork. Now, how can we know? Jesus said, because that's the question that his disciples had. That's the question they came to him with. How can we know? And he said, well, you're going to see this, and you're going to see this, and you're going to see this, and this, and this, and all these are the beginnings of happy days. No, there are signs. And... In the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 12 especially, the wicked are going to do wickedly. None of the wicked will understand who are the wicked. They're contrasted or juxtaposed to the wise. The wicked will do wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. If you want to check out what wise or who is spoken of in the wise just read the book of Daniel and read elsewhere. The wise are those who observe the times. They are watching the times. 
they see that the time has come. That's not always easy to see or easy to meet. So, um, if we look at history as fulfilling prophecy, there's Babylon, there's Medo-Persia, there's Greece, there's Rome, and this is over a period of how many years? Centuries, centuries, centuries. But let's push it all together in three and a half or a few more years. Let's push it together. There's there are statements of plenty prophetically. You're this head of gold, but you're not always going to be gold. You're a great tree, but you're going to get cut down. Yes, you're the leading. You are the first beast. You are the number one beast, but you're going to be humbled. And finally, let's do it this way. Chapter 2, 3, and 4 in the book of Daniel talk about the wealth, the power of wealth for America. 2, 3, and 4. 7 and 8 are not so much about financial matters as about military I saw a ram coming with two horns and he was pushing, 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 bullying. And somebody came from the west across the face of the whole earth and didn't touch the ground. That leaves air and water. I mean, come on. Didn't touch the ground as he came. And he came to the ram, which I'd seen standing beside the river, and he threw him to the ground and stamped on him. And no one came to his aid. Why not? Because the guy with the notable horn coming from the west don't get in the way. And we've identified for 45 years that the time is coming that Iran is going to be the pushy, the pusher, the troublemaker. I know you folk don't follow the news. I know you don't, but uh, Iran has issued warnings. Oh, they've done that for years. No, 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 no. Iran has issued warnings in the last few weeks to the United States and to Israel. Be ready because we're coming. How can you come across the face of the whole earth? Well. Airplanes there, that's easily seen today. How can you come across the face of the whole earth and you don't even have to sit down, sit down on the ground and take, well, that's bombs and missiles. Well, um, I, I know you don't follow the news, but this week the president announced not simply the plan, but the reality of space force, American space force force. And what is the purpose of building and sustaining a space force? You want to go to space? I don't, except when the Lord comes. What's the space force all about? Well, just a decade or two ago, 10 to 20 years ago, there were only a few satellites up there going around. The Russians sent Sputnik up. And within two or three years, we sent our first satellite up. Today, listen, there are several thousand satellites up there going around for all kinds of purposes, communication, spying, all, all kinds of satellites going around. Some of them are killer satellites. If you've never heard of them, get online and do yourself a favor. Just type in killer satellites. And the Russians have them, and the Chinese have them, and we have them, and, and, and. 
What's a killer satellite? Well, it's designed to sit there until it receives a signal from Earth down here. It sits up there in space, ready to maneuver, ready to move and aim its weapons at other satellites. Oh, how are you going to point a bullet? Uh, how, how, how are you going to? No, it's not, it's not done with bullets. It's done with laser weapons. It's done with other weapons that have energy, energy weapons, we call them. And uh, we have our satellites up there, and the Chinese know it, and the Russians know it, and everybody knows it who's in the business. And so they're trying to target our satellites our killer satellites before they launch any of their weapons or use any of their weapons. So they keep us in the crosshairs. All of this is very current. If you don't know it, you're doing yourself a disservice. Well, what does this have to do with Bible prophecy? It has everything to do. Making fire come down out of heaven in the sight of men. It has everything to do. Where are you going to hide when this time comes? God says, find a little place where the houses are not crowded closely together. Right now, this seems silly and far away. It is not silly, and I'm afraid it's not far away. There is too much evidence that Iran is getting ready to do something very silly and stupid. It's, it's just, it's the handwriting on the wall, if, if I can put it that way. Let's say this again. These chapters 2, 3, and 4, they speak of the great wealth. You are gold. You are you are feeding the world. You are. This is our wealth. That's our power is our wealth. These visions, 7 and 8, are about our military prowess. What does that mean? It means exactly what the president said last week to the world. When Russia announced, we have super new weapons and the president said, we have super weapons too. I'm not afraid of super weapons. I'll tell you what I'm, what I'm fearful of. I'm fearful that we have as Christians, and Advent Christians in particular, we have as Christians been given a work to do, a task to meet and complete. I was totally unaware, totally unaware, even though I had gone through the ministerial course, time in seminary, I was totally unaware of the pages and pages and chapters written by the pen of Ellen White about a last work, a final work. The time is coming when all work among us will be closed. All the ways we do evangelism will be will close. Schools, hospitals, evangelists. There will be one thing left, and that's the power of the printed page. I'm quoting. There will be one thing, and that's the printed page. So I was faced with this in 1974. I was driving nails right there on the house, right there, right down there. And friends showed up and said, we believe God wants us to talk to you and we need to tell you what we believe God wants done. We believe God wants you in the publishing work. Oh, I've told you this story, but let's, let's add a little bit. I didn't act like... Uh, Sarah in the tent and laugh behind the tent, but I, you know, 
I said to Joe Ring, who was the publishing secretary for the South Southern Union, I said, Joe, you know this is not for me. Don't say that, Joe said. We've been praying and that's all we've come to ask you to do is just pray about the matter. I'm not going to leave till you promise me you will pray about the matter. I said, all right, Joe, I will pray about the matter. Now, I already knew what the answer would be because I'm a prescient person. I, I, I have the ability to know the future. And I knew that, okay, I'll pray about the matter. But I knew God was going to say, I want you to go take another district and I want you to preach and I want you to do this and so. And I prayed about the matter and I got an answer just like that. This is what I want you to do. I was so struck by how quickly the answer came and how clear the answer was that I called the pastor of the Birmingham First Church and I said, I want a private baptism. I'm coming. Will you draw the water? Brother Charles, just say it and we will draw the water. I said, don't want an audience. Don't want to advertise it. But I want to be rebaptized. And that just, it, it was empowerment. I'm talking about spirit power meant. And I began to see things and understand things, comprehend things that I had never known were in the books. Miracles. I know what miracles look like. I have seen many of them. I see them still. Now this is what I believe, folks. I believe that every person who is in this little community right here, whether they understand it or not, is related to the future of this ministry. Not just the past, not just the present, but the future of this ministry. I believe that when we publish these books and send them to millions of people in this country and abroad, I believe folk are going to be so happy. I believe folk are going to be so pleased. I believe they're going to be sending letters of congratulations. No, I don't believe that. I believe what has been will be again. If they've done these things in a green tree, what are they going to do in a dry? I'm telling you all of this before it comes to pass so that when it comes to pass, you will believe. You will believe. We've tried for years to encourage folk to get survival buckets, get, get some, I still think it's a good idea. And if the date runs out on that bucket, empty it and fill it again. That's what people have been doing for thousands of years in the Bible. Some things are happening that I believe Ellen White was shown and describes. I saw that at this time, talking about the time to come, there will be a time, a, a brief season of great prosperity. I believe that's just about to happen. Oh, I'll take it. Great prosperity. And what is the purpose of that great prosperity? So that you and your family can pay your bills until you are out of bills. So that you and your family can pray and ask God specifically for direction. Is this the safe place? Do we stay here? Do we stay here and find another place to go to when the time comes? Those are answers I don't have. But God does. And we have ample instruction about what to do and what to ask. And when God says, we act, we react, we obey, we do. I was... Uh, I was new to the canvassing work, the book work. Stephanie was five years old. 
my wife was young and beautiful. And I saw right away that the bookwork, I come from a long line of salespeople, my daddy, my grandfather, down the line. I could see that things were being done in the bookwork that hindered the work, that held back progress in the work. And the only way that the work was going, if it was increasing, it was only because they were increasing the price of the books. Not how many books were going out. But, oh, we, we, we did $100,000 more dollars worth of business this year than we did last year. Yeah, you did, but fewer books went out. You just raised the price. So I was sitting here in Chilton County, Alabama, and I was thinking about it, praying about it. And I had a five-year-old daughter who uh, decided to go looking in my cases that, that I took the books to canvas with, show people the books. And my five-year-old daughter would go when I was not out canvassing. She would open the the case, the satchel, and she would practice selling, selling, practice selling books. She could give a good canvas. It's, it's amazing. She would practice selling books. Well, I was asking God, is there a better way? Because I was calling on homes of very sincere people, some of them wealthy some of them poor as church mice. I was calling on them, and if they were poor, they couldn't buy a $50 book. They just couldn't. And I was walking away with, thank you, God bless you. And I was not leaving anything with the people. And Ellen White had spoken specifically to this issue, she had said, Leave something with the people. So I ordered several cases of paperback books from out in Arizona where a group of Adventist laypersons decided the books are too expensive. Let's, let's print some paperback books, inexpensive. And I ordered three or four cases of books. And Judy and uh, Stephanie and I would practice. We'll put these three books in this pack. We'll put these two books in that pack and we would wrap them up with, what was the plastic wrap of the day? Saran wrap or whatever. We, we would practice and we would turn the covers, this cover face out and this side cover out, face out. And sometimes we would have three or four books in a, in a pack. And I began to make room in my case, in my canvassing case, I began to make room to put two or three of these packs in every time I was going out to canvas. Never, never, never did I ever canvas any, uh, again and walk away without leaving something in the hands of the people. Are you listening? I know you can't afford $50 books, but I've got a package of four books for $5. Would you? I take that. I'm telling you this because I have seen the work go, the work that God called me to do, me. I have seen the work go from a few books to millions of books. And I cannot account for it except to say, it is what God wants done. It is what God blesses and prospers. He said to do this, and He has honored me and us and the people who through the years have helped us with gifts, with prayers, with encouragement. God has honored us. But I believe it's only a fraction of what is just ahead. That's just my take on it. Things are about to happen. I got up this morning, one of the first things I did was turn the news on. There's no news, it was just 
gossip. There was no news. What was the news? Because today is the day of decision for Venezuela. And the would-be new president of Venezuela has issued the word that today we are coming. Don't block the highways. We are coming to bring food and medicine and help to our people. And uh, Maduro, the president dictator, has said, we will resist you with our armies. And today, I believe the news is silent about because a lot of people can be killed today. Today. Why does that matter to us? Because the Chinese and the Russians are supplying them. Shielding them, helping them. And the Cubans have come into the picture. And, and, and. We're facing a crisis down there. No, we're facing a crisis everywhere. And it is not that difficult for things to get out of hand and it moves across this border and that border and across that country and across that people and into more bombs, missiles, guns, weapons, whatever. I'm just praying that there will be a peaceful transfer of power and poor people will not lose their lives. But uh, if history means anything, this could be a bad day at Black Rock. Could be a bad day. And every day that we are not doing more in the book work, tension builds, trouble between nations build, and our way is being hedged up before we get there. So we're praying, and I just want you to know that in my praying, I'm praying for you. Get out of debt as quickly as possible. Wouldn't you love to get out of debt? The children of Israel were to march out of Egypt and they had nothing because they were slaves. They were poor. But they left Egypt with great wealth. Now how did that occur? Because God said, and the time has come. And what was the purpose of the great wealth that they left Egypt with? What are you going to do with gold and silver? <clears throat> and cloth and material in the desert. They built according to the instructions shown to Moses in the mountain. They built the sanctuary. <coughs> Pardon me, that's what we are instructed to do except the sanctuary that we are building is character, it's testing, it's trial. This is where we are and this is who we are. And if you don't understand it, you've got enough time to go somewhere, get somewhere, hide somewhere. you got enough time. I'm just thankful, thankful, thankful for what I have seen. This Parkinson's just muddies my memory. But I can remember enough and I can recall enough to know that was a miracle. That was a miracle. One more Carl Porter story. Can't resist it. My intention was to leave here and go to Tuscaloosa for the day because I had a stack of cards from the doctor's offices. And I had quite a few in Tuscaloosa that I needed to go follow up on. And if you're going to go to Tuscaloosa, uh, you can go a variety of ways, and I decided to take the shortcut through the backwoods of Chilton County and Bibb County. Some of you know that way. 
It's kind of a shortcut to get you to Centerville. On this particular occasion, I left with the intent of the, taking the backwoods route get to Tuscaloosa. I rounded a curve somewhere between here and Centerville, out in the woods. No houses this way, that way, no houses this way, that way. You could go two or three miles without seeing a house. And I was making the bend in the curve, and suddenly there's a house. I had seen the house many times, but I'd passed by the house many times. They didn't send the card in. Go to this house. And it's daytime, work time, for the husband of the house to be at work somewhere. That could leave the wife vulnerable at home alone or at home with children or whatever. And uh, I'm a man unknown. And I pulled up in the driveway of this, this house. Not a driveway, just part of the yard. Pulled up. And I got out of the car on the driver's side and went around, got my case on the other side. <coughs> And the lady of the house, a young lady, attractive, young lady of the house came to the door and she latched the screen door. I could see that before I got, you know, smart thing. And uh, I'm about 10 or 12 feet from the door and I said to her, she's behind the screen door, I said to her, I'm the Bible story man. I'm the guy that leaves the books in the doctor's offices. She unlatched the screen and held the door open for me to come in. Are you listening? I said, I apologize for coming without, you know, letting you know ahead of time, but I just felt I should stop and show you the books. And as best I can recall, this is what she said. She said, uh, you know, I've seen those books for several years, but I thought I'll get some of those books one day, but I never got around to it, never sent a card in, never whatever. And I said, well, I'll, I'll just take a few minutes and show you the books, which I did. What I didn't tell you about the 10 feet in front of the screen door, the door, is that I could feel against my shoulder somebody walking with me, pressing against my shoulder. Who do you think that was? Arthritis showing up already. <laughs> I had the sense at the time of knowing God told me to stop at this house. And now I'm going to go through the door and someone is going through the door with me. If you've never experienced something like that, it's, uh, you can't put it in words. I mean, you can, but you can't. She bought several books. She bought a Bible readings for the home. She bought a triumph of God's love. She bought a desire of ages. She bought a family Bible. She didn't have any children, so she didn't buy children's books. But that's all she knew in the doctor's offices. God saw more than that. If you were out and you heard a voice say, go to this home, with your books, go to this home. How would you respond? First of all, you would have to know that it's something supernatural telling you to go to this home. It's a supernatural voice or supernatural experience. Something about what is taking place here is above natural, above nature. It is supernatural. How could I know which voice was speaking? because the devil never told anybody to buy Christian books. That's how you know. 
the devil never encouraged anybody to buy Bible books. I've had guns pulled on me. I've been cursed just about everything you can conjure up for curse words. It's amazing. It's really amazing. It's beyond amazing. It's miraculous. And these are just a foretaste of what is going to happen when the outpouring of the latter rain. Ellen White now close. Many of these books will go on the shelves and go unread. But the day is coming when these books will be sought after. They will be taken down and they will be read. And many will trace to these books. See. Father in heaven, we thank you as a little community, as a little family, as a body of believers. We thank you that this ministry exists because of what you have done and are doing. And we thank you and we praise you for what we have seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears. We thank you for the promise of a greater work yet to be done. Bless us. Help us to hear your voice. Each of us, help us to hear and comprehend. It is the voice of the Spirit. I pray that you will bless these people so that they will know what to ask, how to ask, and how to praise God for answers. We thank you for an opportunity to gather as a, as a family here today and share a meal. We thank you for the power of your Spirit and your Word, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.